I'm Dirk Holemans, co-president of the foundation and director of OICOS, the Flemish Green Think Tank. As we learned yesterday during our first talk, people are following these talks from all over Europe via live stream on Facebook, which is great. And so you also can follow it without having an account. As we want to make it an interactive session, you can uh, put questions uh, through uh, chat on Facebook, but you can also do it on Twitter using the Jeff Europe account. As I said already yesterday, but I really want to repeat this. The corona crisis is of course in the first place a health crisis, which has to be dealt with in the best way. This is priority number one. But the crisis is also changing our societies in profound ways and has resulted in a huge economic crisis. Therefore, it is really important to have a better understanding of the impact of the crisis. How does it affect people living in different parts of Europe? Whether you're living in Sweden, Belgium or Spain, this really can make a difference. Next, we want to explore how we can imagine a better world after Corona. And organizing a better world after Corona, we have, of course, already to do it today. I'm very happy to announce two inspiring speakings today. We have Philip Lamberts, who is co-president of the Greens AFA group in the European Parliament. And we have Mar Garcia, who is secretary general of the European Green Party. Um, Mar, I will start with you. Um, the corona crisis is now already affecting several months our societies. Uh, it is clear we have to handle this crisis on a coordinated European level. Of course, every country is different, but uh, I think it's clear that only by working together we can manage it in a very effective way. And uh, especially, I think, for Greens, who are really uh, fighting for more cooperation, more solidarity in Europe, these are very special times. So from the position of the European Green Party, how do you deal with this crisis? Hello, Dirk. Hello, everybody. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you for also such an inspiring uh, virtual table. Both Dirk and Philippe are uh, people that I look uh, when I uh, very often uh, search for in inspiration. So. Um, Here's what my contribution, yeah. Um, well, uh, you've also asked me to speak about from my Spanish perspective. I will, I think that uh, I will combine a bit both. I think there are still many open questions about how the uh, post COVID will be. Where we need the most clarity about is will there be a vaccine and uh, when will it be uh, available? But also along etc. of questions uh, that we do not know today about the evolution of this virus. Um, these are not minor issues uh, for anybody, but especially for those countries most hit by the highest numbers of death in Southern Europe, like uh, in Italy and Spain. Let me remind you that according to the, according to the uh, health, uh, uh, World Health Organization, uh, from a data from the 21st of April, the sum of those infected from France, Italy and Spain represent 20.3 of the total increased and 37.7 of those kills by the COVID worldwide, 37.7. So those countries, France, Italy and Spain, are the three countries whose governments have imposed the uh, strictest confinement. I can explain a little bit more how, as you were pointing out in the beginning, how different it is to be confined in Spain than in Belgium, for example, or in Sweden. But in that sense, I have the feeling the confinement uh, down here is going to take longer and will look pretty different from other countries as the actual confinement has already been. So the when will these answers be available really matters because that will shape in a major way our immediate future, um, our, immediate, our way uh, immediately after the health crisis is a bit over. Yeah. What we do know is the negative health, economic and social effects this crisis has brought. And, uh, and they are the ugliest the current generation have experienced. So if you apply common sense to those negative effects, uh, um, uh, this, uh, we need to apply unprecedented measures to, uh, to overcome them. Yeah? 
The shaping of these measures and thus the uh, recovery plans will be the battlefield on my understanding the Greens uh, should aim to influence. I will focus now a bit in my Spanish perception of this crisis. I rarely do that since my responsibility is to represent the European perspective, but I will do so today since uh, this is a bit what you asked me for. This crisis has arrived uh, when the consequences of the big recession caused by the 2008 uh, financial crisis are still very, very present within the Spanish society. Let me illustrate that with some figures that the human greed and the uh, casino economy brought us. Um, we reached level of unemployment of 27%, 55% of youth unemployment. Our public debt went from 36% in 2007 to 93% in 2013. Currently, we are at 95.5. The risk premium rose 600 points and rescuing the Spanish banks costed the magic figure of 63,000 billions of euros which is approximately 6.3 of our GDP. The subsequent austerity measures brought us a bearable level of poverty, exclusion, social inequalities, very painful social costs that it has been lengthy discussed among the Greens. This memory is still very, very present in our societies. It is still remembered and acknowledged what does budgetary stability mean or the frivolity about the extravagant way of spending of the South that some manifested. And unfortunately, this is the uh, main voice many Spanish citizens have associated to the European Union the last decade. A recipe that was diagnosed through the, uh, was digested through the pedagogy of pain. So, if we translate that perception to the current crisis that uh, hints a GDP drop of 10%, an unemployment rent rate of 20%, and an increase of the public debt of 10% over horrible figures I mentioned, what the Spanish envisions to come is just a disaster, yeah? But let's shine a bit of light, yeah? And, um, it's obvious that this crisis is not going to last forever because nothing does. Um, uh, and that uh, we are soon going to start a new phase that will require a new setting because uh, too many things are different. Too many things have changed. Already what the European Council came with yesterday is far from what uh, was the framework only three months ago. It's the framework that we, we all were aware of, yeah? I hope that Philippe explains a little bit more about this. For me, uh, there will be no return to the previous normal. There won't be a back to business as usual. So when we talk about recovery, uh, recovery, what is at stake, in my humble opinion, is uh, something that it sounds pretty big, and it is actually pretty big. I think that it's, what is at stake is the political reordering of the economy. The political reordering of the economy. And not only at a national level, but also if we are able to address it at a European level. Because let's be honest, yeah, there is no way to pay in the short term and with the economic rules that were in place until three months ago, the public spending that will be necessary to face this crisis. Hence, um, the question will be who will define and which are the new rules in place? I think there is two options, basically. The one built only taking the national approach, built by narrow provincial minds that understand nations are the only element to take into consideration when designing the recovery plans, and that what is needed is to return to what we had before. Or the one that understands that uh, the way forward must come through a united, a common strategy that strengthens us to face future crises, because let's not forget that we have a scientific proven crisis on front of us and that's the climate one and that uh, and and this one that uh, that comes from the ones that understand that we need welfare states set for the 21st century as for the first option uh, what this pandemic has already made us all aware of is our extraordinary fragile nations yeah we've been very fragile as uh, member states we have been dependent on large global production and distribution change, which were not able to guarantee access to the goods that were neither in key moments. We just need to remember the amount of shameful newspaper articles about EU member states competing and speculating 
in the international market for medical equipment. I think that today the concept of a nation that cares is no longer viable, detached from a European caring framework. And in that sense, I believe our societies are for the second option. And here is where it comes also my positive note. Unlike the period 2008 to 2014, in which we, the citizens, were victims or in the best cases, passive spectators of the financial crisis and its consequences, in this health COVID crisis, citizens are proactive protagonists, active characters of the film. Back then, um, we were forced to assume the lowering of our salaries, the reduction of our hospital beds, the decrease of the number of teachers for our kids, without having a chance to interview beyond what we already did, which is voting. Yeah? And some of us did vote for, for a change. Today, though, I think that is different, and that, and that is very important and key. Today, it is the citizenship, the one that has taken the option to consciously follow the confinement. Our societies have very clearly understood that it is an act of responsibility to be confined. We wear masks and gloves to protect our neighbors. We give up visiting our loved ones to protect them. We have kept our kids at home, depriving them from socializing, from mixing with their friends. And we have all done that aware, thoroughly understanding, complying. Everybody complies with the restriction and recommendations of the authorities. Let me just illustrate this difference on the perception of a regular citizen with an example. In 2008 and on, a citizen felt that the, that the deterioration of the welfare state, of the public services, of the labor market in an individual way. As we were hit according to the personal needs of each person's daily life. Today, I think, or I believe, this is no longer the case. The threats to our public health and to our welfare states are perceived and acknowledged in a collective level, in a collective way. I think that this is no longer about me not having access to a hospital bed or an operation when I need it, on the time that I need it. This is about our health system. This is no longer about my child having two hours less of class a week. This is about the education of this whole generation. In this crisis, in the COVID crisis, citizens are active contributors to the solution. While in 2008 and on, they were passive victims. It's a very, very important change, I believe. And this is why I think that we've seen, we've been able to witness so much solidarity also along this crisis. We have the clapping that goes all over Europe every day to thank the workers from the many sectors at eight o'clock. We have massive support to, uh, uh, of people to provide neighbors with necessary food, shopping uh, facilities, people allowing homeless to stay in their empty apartments. I've also witnessed that. Citizens contributing to local business in order to help them overcoming their sales drop. So I believe that this crisis has also shown the honest solidarity of the human being in a generalized way. But to summarize, what is at stake at the new is the new normal, the new rules, and citizens have played their part. It's now time for politicians to play their role, but these politicians will be faced with a society that has memory, that is fully aware of the seriousness of the situation, that has been active and solidary at its most, and that has a comprehensive social perception of what is really important when life is at stake. So the definition of this new normal, of this post-COVID no normality, will have to take into consideration all these. And I think it's going to be about values. The battle that we're going to have to play is going to be an, an ideological, a purely ideological one about which values are the recovery measures going to mirror. And I think that this is where we Greens are best placed. We bring along the values our societies are ready to embrace because they're the best recipes to become resilient, sustainable, and just. And in that debate, Europe, the role of Europe is going to be at the very center. The recovery measures cannot be like the ones that were used and put in place in 2008. I'm convinced that they will not be the same, but. The Greens um, have to fight for a uh, recovery plan that also highlights our priorities. I think that until now, we have been able to highlight two issues that nobody dares at that stage of the crisis dares to, to, contradict, to contradict. 
a, a joint European response to the crisis is needed, you know, and the confirmation that COVID is a new symptom, symptom of the main and more serious disease that afflicts the planet and that it's unsustainability. So just to finalize, I mean, I believe the only possible way forward is that one committed to solidarity, sustainability and shared pros, uh, progress. I very honestly believe that uh, the public opinion is going to back our proposals. And at least from a very humble uh, position, this is the endeavor of uh, the European Greens. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, first uh, answer. And I think it's already very informative. Uh, we need a political reordering of the economy. It will be a more collective uh, response. Uh, there's an emphasis on values. The values we choose will guide the way we will uh, rebuild our society, our economy. I think that's very uh, clear. Uh, I just was informed that Philippe will join us within uh, a few minutes. So let me ask you, meanwhile, this question, uh, Mar. Uh, Having said this, that we have to steer on values, how do you look at the European Commission? How have they dealt until now with the crisis? Well, I think that uh, they're not half tried. They have not tried their best, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, Van, von der Leyen uh, herself uh, already like publicly admitted and apologized to the Italians. Um, at the very beginning of the crisis, so the Italian call for solidarity. So um, I think that uh, one uh, illness of this current European Union is the lack of strong leaders uh, with a clear uh, plan on uh, how to bring this European Union for, further. And uh, I think this has been um, something that ha this crisis has shown, the way the uh, answers have been uh, addressed until now. So um, I wish that uh, uh, the uh, I I wish that the current uh, European Commission uh, shows a bit more of uh, this leadership and this clarity on what type of uh, recovery plan they want to put forward. I believe they're going to present it next week, if I'm not mistaken. So um, uh, very much looking forward to see what uh, what they come up with. There's, of course, uh, already uh, a plan on the table for some months. It's the Green New Deal. Um, some parts of it, like Farm to Fork, seems to be uh, postponed a few weeks. Should this Green New Deal be uh, kept on the table, uh, reinforced? Uh, what role should it play? Well, um, my humble opinion is there is no way this. Uh, Green Deal uh, has uh, can be postponed uh, because um, I mean, if something uh, has proved this uh, crisis is that uh, we are not prepared. Uh, we were not prepared to face. I mean, I was reading also a an interview from the minister of uh, from Spanish minister of technology saying that um, by far we didn't have a plan for this. Well, um, it, we should have a plan for facing the climate crisis. And that should be the Green Deal. We Greens have been advocating for a very long time for this plan. Um, I think that there is no more excuses not to have it ready. Okay, thank you for this comment on the new Green Deal. Philip, if everything goes well, you can hear me. And um, of course, as the co-president of the Greens FR group in the European Parliament, you have been following uh, how the European institutions, the Commission, the Council, the Parliament has uh, reacted to the crisis. But I can imagine that for quite some people, it's not very clear what happened and, and week after week, what were the reactions. So I know it's a difficult question, but could you inform us how Europe reacted until now? It depends on what you call Europe. I mean, uh, if you call the European, that the European Union, uh, there's at least three major institutions in the European let's, Union. Let's start with the Commission. Well, the Commission has been taken by surprise, as we all have. Uh, obviously, we, we should have reacted, I think, more strongly at the beginning. 
and uh, and probably put restrictions to our intercontinental travel. But anyway, uh, I will not point any fingers to anyone because at the, every level people were taken by surprise or did not basically uh, uh, get an idea of the the magnitude of the uh, of the pandemic before it came, became too late. Let's face it. So uh, a blame game is not really interesting now. Uh, I heard many criticisms about the lack of uh, reaction of Europe, uh, you know, citizens uh, writing to me and expressing frustration. Uh, there's two sides to the response. The first, response, the first side is an institutional one. When it comes to health, uh, public, public health and health care, the competencies are at national level. That's fact. So the European Union is not a federal state which has the levers that allows it to its uh, its direction to 27 member states. That's not how it works. And by the way, there's a parallel here between uh, the pandemic and the asylum crisis. Many people were angry at the European Union for lack of a, a common response. But then again, asylum and migration are mostly uh, member state competencies. So I could say that basically, uh, if you really want Europe to act, then the first thing that you have to do is to give Europe European institutions, the levers, and transfer the competences there, and then you will be able to judge whether you like the actions or not. But that's a, that's a, uh, only one side of the response. The the other side is what has been witnessed by the components of the European Union, that is the member states. So yes, indeed, the the competences were in their hands. But when you listen to uh, the prime ministers and heads of states uh, speaking. Uh, when the crisis started and when measures were taken, actually every single head of state and government took decisions pertaining to its own country. I mean, when Angela Merkel spoke to the Germans, the word Europe was not mentioned once. And I, I or Emmanuel Macron, uh, the first uh, uh, few times he, he addressed the French uh, uh, population, he did not even mention Europe. So basically, the message, the implicit message of each member state is we are on our own. We are on our own. And the actions taken by a number of member states, like precluding export of uh, medical equipment from one member state to the other, just confirmed uh, the general perception that actually member states are not showing solidarity. And now we had a council yesterday, which was another uh, of those meetings where this lack of, uh, of, uh, of solidarity becomes blatantly obvious. So that is maybe the more fundamental reason uh, why people are, are not happy about Europe. It's because governments in Europe prefer to play their own game. And, uh, and, and that's a fact. I mean, facing such a crisis, I mean, if at European level, the leaders, as they like to call themselves, I mean, the heads of states and governments like to call themselves, themselves leaders, if do not send a very clear message. Dear fellow citizens, we are in this together and we are going to come out of this together and backing up that strong statement by strong actions. If that is not coming, then you may come to wonder. And I know that many in Italy, in Spain and in other countries feel like that. Why do we have a European Union to start with? If in such massive crisis, Basically, it's everyone on its own. And so I do believe that, and, and that was again abundantly clear yesterday, the heads of states and government do not believe that we are in this together. I, 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 would, I would say there's diversity, of course, around the table. And let's face it, you may like Macron or not, but at least he's been very outspoken in the Financial Times and in his press statements that this is a, a time of, of truth for the European Union. Uh, but the fact is that between saying this and building the coalition to force solidarity to happen, uh, there's a gap. And I mean, uh, France here should have teamed up with Spain, with Italy, so you would have the number two, number three, number four economies of the Eurozone to basically corner the so-called virtuous states who are not that virtuous at all, um, and, and, and basically create a tension within the, the, the Council uh, and, you know, the way to do that is to basically say, OK, well, we need to react together. If the 27 don't do it, then there will be a coalition of the willing doing it. And I do believe that that will have 
uh, uh, governments like the German government, the, the Dutch government, think twice. Because then they will start realizing that the risk is a breakup of the Eurozone, a breakup of the European Union. And then they will maybe come to realize that actually it's not a matter of showing, I would say, uh, uh, charity to one another. It's a matter of common interest. And that is what is totally lacking. I mean, you still hear very much, and especially when you listen to the Dutch finance minister, Wopke Hoekstra, uh, who is coming from the, the Christian Democrats, the terms he uses to it, it are moral terms. It's like they are the virtuous ones and they, they are, you know, the, the, the lazy ones or, or the people who are the sinners, basically. And then that creates the opposite discourse in the South where basically they, 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 they call uh, the, the, those countries or the, those governments as uh, uh, the egoists. Uh, the, the people who cannot show solidarity. We should get out of this moralistic debate. This is a matter of common interest. But the fact is that most of the heads of states and government do not see the response as a matter of common interest. And of course, citizens are not stupid. They feel this. Meeting after meeting, they realize that solidarity is not forthcoming. And if solidarity will be forthcoming, everyone will realize because of its of the duration to take the decision that it, this will be a reluctant solidarity it will be a food dragging solidarity and if if this is what europe is about then i understand that many people will want to turn their backs on europe this is a, an existential challenge to the european construction and we have to realize that i, I i'm proud to be part of a political family that has grasped this because again if you speak with Greens, not just in the South, but in Germany, in Finland, in Austria, etc., they we all sing to the same uh, uh, hymn. Uh, and this is what we proud. But then again, the Greens are ten percent of the of the well represent ten percent of the glo European population. So, well, we need allies. Okay, thank you, already for, yeah, thank you already for this uh, uh, first response. Uh, you uh, described very well what is lacking at the European level. I can uh, imagine the Greens are developing their own proposals, their own package. What kind of package we need to really install uh, responsibility, a common economic uh, recovery plan and solidarity plan also uh, from the financial point of view? Well, uh, first, the, the first issue that, uh, that, well, the first question that you need to answer is the size. Because in such circumstances, it's obvious if you want to uh, keep our economy from collapsing, and if you want to give ourselves a chance to reorient it, well, you need massive, massive investments. And here we're talking about mobilizing between 1 and 2 trillion euros, that is between 1,000 and 2,000 billion euros right now you might say this is enormous well actually the gdp of the european union is between 13 and 14 trillion right a year so we are not talking about something that is out of our reach it's perfect within our reach but we need to mobilize that uh, now second thing is who needs to mobilize that let's be clear it won't be the market we what, what this pandemic does is reminding us that when vital interests of society are at stake, it's not the market, it's the state, it's all democracy that has to take over. And so there's hierarchy between the two. The defense of the general interest is the task of democracy, not the task of the markets. And therefore, you need uh, leadership from the governments at all levels. I mean, European, national, regional, local, and that, there's a parallel to be drawn with the New Deal of uh, Roosevelt. Basically, the economy had collapsed, and it was only the initiative of the state that kick-started the economy again. So, the state takes the initiatives, I mean, the governments take the initiative, the size counts, so between one and two trillion. Three, it has to be for the long haul. You cannot just say, okay, let, let's do an effort for the next two years. We are, we are gone for probably a decade of reinvestment and reorientation. And that has to be funded by long-term debt. What? Debt? You, yes, debt. Of course, debt. 
I mean, when again, vital interests are at stake, you need to commit massive amounts of, of means now for, in order to guarantee your future. And, and just to take an example, and that's another one that came 10 years after the, the, the meltdown in 1929, and that's World War II. I mean, when the British government decided to continue the war against Nazi Germany, they did not reflect in the sense of, can we afford it? Or uh, is it good for the economy? Or do our budgetary rules allow for that? No. Perception was this is a vital threat to our societies, and therefore we will do whatever it takes. And you know what? The, the war debts of the British government that they were incurred during World War II were finally reimbursed in 2008. Right? So we have to go for the long haul. And the final point. And this is again where uh, where the heads of states uh, fall short. It has to be collective. It cannot be individual member states borrowing in order to do their part. It has to be done together. And there, I would say it's a matter of solidarity, of course, because well, there's divergences within the eurozone, within the European Union. Not all member states are in the same fiscal position are in the same have the same economic structure uh, are impacted the same way i mean when 10 15 percent of your gdp depends on tourism you are not in the same position as if uh, 20 percent of your gdp depends from the wood industry so i mean you are not hit the same way and therefore if we leave it to member states i guarantee you don't forget the eurozone crisis the tensions within the eurozone will explode and it will lead to the explosion of the eurozone and therefore of the european union so it has to be together now people say yes yeah, so that the, the lazy ones can benefit from the good signature of the virtuous ones no that is not the thing that of course the the, the collective signature of the european union is of good quality but it has to do not just with the fact that Germany is on board. It has also to do with this thing that has played in favor of big financial multinationals in the past, but that should play in favor of the European Union that is being too big to fail. Together, we are too big to fail. And therefore, that gives us strength in the financial markets as well. So collectively, we can do it. But then again, if we go separately, I bet you, the European Union is living its last decade. Because not only, not only we will basically create disunity and create divergence within the European Union, but I know a number of people outside of the European Union who will just uh, blow on the flames and, and, and try to aggravate the situation. Look at how Xi Jinping is, is acting. Look at how uh, Vladimir Putin is acting. Look at how Donald Trump, I mean, they wish the dissolution of the European Union, and now the British government would, would would very much like that because they can go back to the traditional uh, geopolitical action of the United Kingdom, that is, divide the continent and play one against the other. Frankly speaking, we've been there before, and we don't want to get there again. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Maybe, uh, Philippe, uh, another question. Um, you talked about the Council yesterday, which was very disappointing, about the Commission. Uh, what is the what the role of the European Parliament at this moment? Let's face it, uh, and now we realize it even more. I mean, democracy is about not just voting stuff. It's about debating, deliberating. And there, let's face it, when human beings cannot meet with, with one another, well, deliberation is made more complex. And yes, of course, we can use tools such as this one, but frankly if you've been in a parliament if you know how collective mind shaping happens is by direct interaction of people with people and therefore yes the parliament is at the moment on a slow burner uh we we are well aching to uh, to get back to work but we are touched by the uh by the uh, uh pandemic all the uh, all the same as uh, anyone else so at the moment the parliament is indeed trying uh, to have its voice heard. Uh, we adopted a resolution last week, but then again, uh, working at a distance does not allow you, well, as I said, to deliberate, but also to um, to express positions with all the nuances uh, that you need to to, uh, to to be exactly on the uh, to the point. And therefore, 
uh, well, we will we will be heard. We, we will work again on legislation, and there will be a lot of legislation to adopt uh, in the next few months. But uh, bear with us for for the moment, because well, as long as we cannot reconvene physically, it's going to be quite uh, difficult, and that's the case for every parliament. Now, there's a risk, an inherent risk there for democracy, because indeed, in many member states and de facto at the European level, the executive branch has. Uh, special privileges in crisis situations. And the risk indeed is that you weaken every day more the other branches of government, that is the judiciary and the, and the legislative. And in some member states, it goes further than that. It, it's weakening the media. It's basically uh, uh, putting the parliament out of business. And uh, this is one of the risks of uh, this crisis, is that the natural tendency of executives to grab power will, of course, uh, uh, play at the maximum in a crisis situation. And we need to get back to a more normal way of functioning with checks and balances, which are at the heart of democracy. OK, thank you very much. Uh, also, uh, this physical uh, meeting is, of course, quite different from uh, this virtual meeting. I mean, it's quite different from a physical, but we are happy that we are receiving questions from people over all over Europe. And um, Mar, there's a question for you here. Uh, somebody, somebody writes, I was very happy to hear you believe we need welfare states fit for the 21st century. What is your vision for them? Yeah, okay, so I think I'm messing with the microphone also with the uh, host, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, well, uh, what has uh, been uh, also seen after um, uh, the uh, consequences of how the 2008 financial crisis was uh, um, dealt with uh, that I was mentioning before is that uh, the circumstances in which the different member states have um, faced the current crisis have not been exactly the same. And this is not entirely due to uh, um, the... Uh, um, way the member states were handling their welfare systems. I've, I've always uh, point out that the, the different historical circumstances all over Europe have also had an influence on how the democracies uh, have uh, arisen. I mean, the fact that the Central and Northern European uh, cities were developing their democracies in the 50s and in the South uh, countries, we were under dictatorship and only uh, 20 years after we were able to solidify our democracies have had an impact, of course, in the development of their different wel welfare states. But what, uh, um, what, on top of this, let's say, retardé uh, mem uh, development of the democratic and welfare um, systems, uh, we had to uh, support some of the countries was uh, the consequences of the, uh, un of the austerity measures that were applied. And uh, how I, uh, when I think about the, the 21st century welfare states, I believe of um, uh, well-funded, um, as uh, Philippe was uh, mentioning, well-funded uh, governments, well-funded uh, states that are facing and, uh, and have the priority of fulfilling the needs of the uh, citizens in order to develop their lives at the, their best, yeah? So uh, I believe that uh, a reordering and a reshaping of the uh, different uh, public services needs to be done because the last trend of the last 10 years have been about privatizing and uh, prioritizing market-oriented uh, decisions rather than the fulfillment of the citizens' uh, necessities. Okay, thank you. Uh, Philippe, uh, there's a question for you. Uh, what will happen to the Green European Deal? Uh, during and after this corona crisis? Well, uh, actually, maybe I, I'm an optimist, but uh, I think that, uh, that uh, of course, there will be resistance. But uh, guess what? There was already resistance before the pandemic. But actually, I do believe that in, in the perspective of the, the, the green uh, transition, that this crisis offers opportunities. Let me explain. Uh, Indeed, when the pandemic struck, uh, you had a number of players uh, screaming that, you know, this was not the time, that because of this pandemic, we should postpone. Who were these people? Well, the people who, before the pandemic, were already saying that. 
It's exactly the same people. So they just found a new alibi, a new excuse to back up their uh, conservatism. I, what I didn't see really are new players uh, coming to the front saying, well, we were in favor, but now we change our minds. This I didn't see so much. Now, interestingly, the European Commission, which decided to put a European Green Deal at the heart of its, uh, of its policies, has firmly, uh, well, stands squarely uh, behind the European Green Deal. Now, uh, don't mistake me, I mean, obviously, the European Green Deal proposed by the Commission is insufficient in and in ways incoherent. I mean, having a European Green Deal where you say, don't change the trade policy and you don't change the, co the common agricultural policy, it's a bit of a, of, a, of a weak Green Deal. But actually, there's a lot uh, already in the Green Deal, but indeed, uh, uh, the common agricultural policy and the trade policy are, are not covered and these are, they, are, they have major importance. So we need to fight to expand the Green Deal, but at least the European Commission has given absolutely no sign to back, uh, to, to back up from that. Now, if you look at the Parliament, the Parliament has reaffirmed, and that was to me one of the main elements of the resolution we adopted last week, the Parliament has affirmed its majority uh, uh, position of making the Green Deal at the heart of our recovery strategy. So I would say on that side we are covered. So where is the problem that where well, where it was before the pandemic with the member states? And you can think of a number of member states who are uh, actually actively resisting to the Green Deal. You might think, ah, okay, it's the usual suspects, Poland and, and the Czech Republic, and hey, hang on one second, look to Germany. I mean, Germany has been one of the major uh, stumbling blocks against any serious climate action in Europe, despite the perceptions. I mean, Germany defends diesel, defends coal industry, hates change. Therefore, uh, we will still face these oppositions, obviously. But there's also a coalition of, of member states who want to be ambitious on that. Now, that's the institutional aspect. Why do I say that I believe that the Green Deal stands more chances to happen? I mean, the Green Deal, I mean, the ecological and social transition. Why do I believe that this pandemic helps? Because it is shaking our societies very deeply. I mean, many... Uh, Many things that have been considered common wisdom in decision-making circles have become suddenly much harder to defend. For instance, that the market always knows best. Well, we know it's not the case. That the global scale is always the right scale. People now speak about relocalization and not just the greens. That efficiency is everything. While actually efficiency, maximizing efficiency, is always at the detriment to the detriment of resilience that is the ability to withstand shocks. So, on many aspects, uh, things that were considered common wisdom have been proven false. Okay, and I would just like to take again the example of Emmanuel Macron. I mean, Emmanuel Macron was elected on a platform. On, in social and economical terms that was totally neoliberal. So he wanted to bring to France the neoliberal reforms that were made elsewhere. I mean, tax reforms that favored the rich, reducing the public services, uh, uh, trusting the market for everything, adapting France to globalization. One of the first speeches of the same Macron, who is a neoliberal economically, uh, after the beginning of the pandemic, he praises public services. He praises resilience. He praises relocalization. He says globalization has gone too far. You might think, hey, hang, hang on, this guy doesn't believe anything of what he says. Probably not. But the fact that he feels compelled to utter these things means that, in his view, public opinion has shifted. And that's his original discourse, pro-globalization, pro-rich, uh, pro-inequality, pro-market against public services, that this simply doesn't make it again. And if he wants to win, he needs to change course. Now, how credible he is, that's, I, I, I leave to the French citizens to decide. I wouldn't believe him, him too much. But the fact that he has totally changed this course shows that something is playing, or at least that within the political class, 
that those who were the defenders of the status quo of neoliberal globalization feel on the defensive. And you know what? When they feel on the defensive, I go on the offensive. And that's what we are going to do the next few months and years. Okay, thank you. It's a bright explanation. Uh, we have other questions. One question uh, for Ma is that you also see with the corona crisis uh, rising extremism. And how should we fight this uh, also negative evolution in society? Well, um, I didn't exactly say that, or at least I don't recall it, but I do have uh, pointed out two options that I believe that were the only possible. The one that, uh, you know, took the member, the states, the nation state as the element in order to uh, bring, uh, build the recovery plan uh, and that, that understood uh, that a shared common progress uh, was needed in order to uh, build that uh, upon. Um, I mean, uh, the extremisms have been there for the last uh, decade uh, or even longer. And unfortunately, they uh, took uh, a bigger space than we would have liked it. But uh, I've also said it, and that was before the crisis. It, it's still valid now. Uh, they failed to uh, achieve the majorities that they wanted in order to uh, become the majoritarian, uh, let's say, uh, field in the European Parliament. That Philippe's not much better than me. So despite the uh, uh, um, the uh, sizes of the different groups have changed. Uh, they did manage. They didn't manage to uh, uh, win. Let's say the battle uh, against the uh, idea of the Europe that we Greens uh, fight for uh, after the European elections. So. Um... Okay. Thanks. And I have another question. Uh, I want to ask you. Somebody's writing that we shouldn't uh, only focus on Europe, but of course other parts of uh, the world like Africa are also very uh, hard affected by the crisis. And so how could we as Europe play a role to build more global solidarity with these other regions that are really uh, on the dire shock? Uh, I would mention two things. First, there will be a need of debt restructuring uh, and debt cancellation. Because obviously, the, the economic shock that will come uh, to Africa uh, will be even more destructive than what we have known. And it comes on top of the plagues uh, uh, that, uh, that, that have hit Africa in terms of autocracy, war, resource exhaustion, climate change. So the pandemic com comes on top of that. And, and they are much less uh, well equipped than we are. Uh, materially to face uh, to face the thing. So we will need uh, financial help. The other thing is that uh, there will be a big battle uh, once uh, medications and vaccines exist uh, against the coronavirus, because as you know, the pharma industry, uh, they are basically rent seekers like any other multinational and they want to uh, milk the cow. And especially when there's an emergency, they want to 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 uh, get a windfall from that. Uh, and there, we will need to be very strict in terms of uh, lifting uh, 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 lifting internet intellectual property rights uh, on those medicines. Sorry, life comes before profit. And there, the European Union can do a lot if it wants to, but, but then again, it's gonna be at the expense of, uh, say, previously orthodox economic thinking. Uh, again, uh, I do believe that our fates are intertwined between Africa and Europe, and uh, we have historical historical responsibilities towards that continent. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but we cannot just turn, uh, uh, look the other way. We will need to uh, to play an active role here uh, together with the African Union, knowing full well that governance issues will stand uh, in the way that we are not dealing with a host of uh, democracies, well-functioning institutions. But uh, anyway, life comes first, and we will need to uh, uh, to do our part. Okay, thanks. Uh, about what the ideas of the Greens are for these uh, new welfare systems and how this is connected with the Rila relocalization of economic production. And, and I think uh, in Spain, in Barcelona, we already have some uh, good examples of it. And you com can combine this with, uh, let's say, the initiatives, the solidarity of people. Uh, 
producing their own mask and so so on. So what could be the role of more local production and, and local communities in this? I'm going, I'm going to uh, also ask Philip to jump on this because uh, as uh, I, it, it doesn't, doesn't belong to me to explain a little bit. Maybe Philip, you can be a bit, a bit of a hint of this recovery plan and measures that uh, are um, already like discussing among uh, to uh, to face uh, the post COVID um, where um, these issues are hinted there. Um, <clears throat> I was pointing out, and uh, that doesn't have to be uh, that much about uh, exclusively the recovery, I'll leave that to Philippe, but uh, what I was uh, also pointing out, and I would like to underline because Philippe has uh, hinted uh, about these, you know, um, um, holy ideas that are now being questioned is a bit what I was mentioning when I was uh, pointing out the uh, level of, sol of generalized solidarity that uh, has been on the ground uh, on our communities. That is probably what I believe that uh, is uh, uh, making the politicians questions the holy truths that were uh, until now uh, on the ground and uh, ideologically kind of um, assumed and is making uh, people like uh, Macron uh, delivering uh, this change of this message. Nothing to do with the relocalization question, but uh, I wanted to uh, just comment before what is probably going to be the last question. Yes, okay, thanks. So then we go to Philippe for this uh, question on in yeah. industrial policy. Yeah, well, it's not just industry policy, but this issue of, of relocalization is uh, very important because uh, this is also a place where the national populists have a, have a field day in the sense that they will say we can only rely on ourselves if we want uh, to be resilient. And there may be a temptation to say, OK, let's do everything local and so we will be self-reliant. But actually, if you think in terms of resilience, that is not the best way to achieve resilience. I mean, shifting from everything global to everything local makes you vulnerable as well because if you are hit and basically you live on a, on a sort of island uh well basically you cannot call upon others to help so isolation from the rest of the world is not the best recipe yet full-scale globalization isn't either so we really need to again get out of this simplistic worldview where efficiency is all and efficiency measured by profit bigger Long, uh, uh, further, faster is always better. For some things, you need the scale. I mean, you may like or dislike airplanes, but if you want to build uh, an intercontinental airplane, no, every country will not uh, design and build such things, right? So you will need to, to do that at several places in the world, but you don't need uh, uh, one aircraft manufacturer in Belgium and another one in Luxembourg and another one, etc. You get my point. Conversely, so for, for some activities, global is the right scale. But let me take food. I mean, what, what, what sense does it have to import milk powder in Europe from New Zealand? I mean, exactly at the other side of the planet. What, what sense does it make to import in Europe beef and pork meat from Canada, as was agreed as part of the CETA trade deal? I mean, this is stupid. It is stupid climate-wise, but it is also stupid in terms of self-reliance. You know, the original common agricultural policy was about basically food sovereignty, giving Europe the ability to provide its own food. That doesn't mean that you don't exchange food with the rest of the world. There's stuff that you can grow in other parts of the world that you can't grow in Europe. Okay. But most of it, you are self-reliant. And that's obvious. Well, now we have a common agricultural policy that drives efficiency for the European farmers to be able to sell on the global markets. That is stupid. That is stupid and criminal, I would say. And that is where you need a drastic change, of course. And bring the common agricultural pol policy back to its original uh, goal, which was ensure food sovereignty for Europe, not at country level, but at a continent level. So again, it's not Belgium should be isolated, but the whole market is basically European Union. 
That's how it should be, because actually Europe is not that big. Right? It's two percent of the of the land on this planet, so it's quite small. But we should be able to basically be self-sufficient in terms of food. And again, that doesn't mean that you cannot import bananas from a Central America. No problem. But uh, this is a sideshow. The main show is basically we make the food that we need and that increases resilience. But then again, it's not like that for every domain. Another good example that, well, the crisis made me aware of is that for basic drugs such as paracetamol, so a, a simple painkiller, Europe is 100% dependent from basically India. And does that make sense? Hang on one second. I mean, uh, resilience come comes, of course, from reducing the complexity of a system. And indeed, when you reduce it, well, basically, uh, you make it sturdier, but it, it may be less financially efficient, but that's life. But also multiplying the sources that indeed, well, maybe we can still import paracetamol from uh, India, but maybe not all of it. Maybe we can do some stuff locally and import some stuff. And then the more sources we uh, you have, the more resilient you are, you, you are too. But again, to me, the critical thing in terms of uh, policymaking is not so much the distance argument. It's the resilience argument. So the idea that, yes, you need to make trade-offs with efficiency in order to be more resilient. Of course, having multiple sources is costlier than having only one. You might dispute that because you may have competition and that may drive prices down. Again, having, having a local supplier, it may be more expensive, but then again, you can rely on it. Look at, the, at this issue of masks now. We are receiving masks from China, which are basically not up to standard. Yeah, of course, because they see a business opportunity and they think uh, some producers think that they, they, they can uh, they, they can sell junk to Europe and given the, the emergency, junk will be sold at good prices. Well, if you have several uh, uh, several suppliers, well, maybe uh, you will be uh, in a better position. So we should really, how should I say? I mean, I'm not saying that we should forget about the issue. The, the, the point is that in all things, the neoliberal version of globalization to simplistic solutions, maximizing one thing, profit, efficiency, and there we should be smarter because the world is complex and you need to think with the complexity of the world and say, okay, yes, we, we can strive for efficiency, but there's uh, limits to what we are going to accept in terms of losing resilience. It's always, I mean, all decisions in our lives are trade-offs. We need to find the right balance. And I believe that what Corona has, has shown is that all societies were totally and still are totally out of balance. Okay. So when you're more resilient and basically your immunity system works better. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I see we, without noticing, we, our time is all, almost up. Uh, I would uh, like to end with a more uh, personal question. Uh, all of us in this corona time are restrained of doing some things we normally do, and so there are certain things we miss. And so my question for you is, uh, what is the first thing you will be doing once the restrictions in place are lifted. So, Mar, what would you do? Well, I'm going to be very simple, yeah, because um, I do have my kid away for medical reasons. So, sorry, but the very first thing that I'm going to do is to go and search for him. That's quite uh, clear and obvious. I really wish it can uh, happen very soon. Uh, Philip? Well, uh, very much the same thing. We want uh, we will bring all the family at one place, uh, either in Belgium or in France, and uh, and and meet again. We have half the family here, and the others are, are scattered. We are going to bring them together and uh, and celebrate. Okay, thank you. I think this is really something we mind bring the families back together and and celebrate. And yeah, as I said, let's hope uh, it won't take too long. And uh, I will not try to uh, make a summary of this very inspiring hour. The thing that I think two points were really crucial is one, 
we need a political reordering of the economy based on values such as care and solidarity. The second point is that uh, instead of our economy being based on efficiency, we really need to uh, start from the point of resilience, how to build a resilient economy, how to build a resilient society. So, Mar and Philippe, I really want to thank you for this uh, special kind of interview. For the people who have been following is thank you very much. If you really appreciate this kind of talks and you want to allow us to make more, you can uh, make a donation, which would be very much appreciated. And you can find the link in the chat. And uh, I'm happy to already announce you the third session next week, which will be on feminism in post-corona times. So thank you for being with us and I wish you all the best for the weekends. Bye. Okay, we are not live anymore. So, oh, I see Philippe is already gone. <laughs> Clip. So, all right. thank you. Thank you very much. No. It, it was the- It was great. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. And, uh,